Okay, uh, we are now live, Facebook Live. Uh, I'm guessing folks will start coming in in just a few seconds. Chris Crossman's here with me. Uh, we're doing two Facebook Lives at the same time. We're doing the Bad Water 135. That's what yours is called, right, Chris? Yeah. And we're doing mine on my, uh, it's called Vinnie Tortorich's Athletes page. And now we're going to start a podcast. So here we go with the podcast. I am Vinny Tonerich, and folks, here we are again on the Friday show. This is the one where we bring a luminary and someone with uh, way more knowledge than me. But as it turns out, that's not very tough to do. Uh, and today we have a repeat guest, a guy who's been on probably more than any other Friday guest. I'm going to go. He's, he was actually on the original show with me and Anna way back when we only had like 60 or 70 shows. But he's been on several times. He's the guy who started the Badwater Company, Badwater 135, Badwater, uh, Salt and Sea, Badwater, Cape Fear, Badwater. Is there any other Badwater? We've got some things in the works. Yeah, there's a lot. Now, from now on, you need to have that mic on you because that's how, and you got to be right in it. By the way, folks, it always annoys me because his voice for radio is so much better than mine. I'm talking about one of the best ultra athletes uh, to ever grace the planet. Most people don't know that about him. They think he's just a race director. I'm talking about Chris Kostman. How you doing, buddy? I am stoked to be here, Vinny. I thought this was my show, though, but go ahead. Yeah, it's your show. <laughs> it's my show. But you know, we're going to make it your show. Yes. Uh, but I just wanted to let, you know, since we're doing three things I know, here, it's great. I wanted to start by just letting my audience know what we're doing. So let me tell these people what we're doing, and then you can take over from there. Got it. Okay. Um, Chris is basically going to be interviewing me again, right, Chris? Yep. And, um, it's because uh, of the 135 coming up. This show is coming out on Friday. The 135 starts on Monday, right after the show comes out. And um, my company, purevitaminclub.com, more directly, the Ultra Salt, is one of the sponsors this year for the toughest race on the planet. And hopefully Chris will be asking me, and I want to ask you, can I ask you that question before we get started? Yes, go ahead. Is it considered the toughest foot race on the planet? It is. National Geographic uh, ranked all of the toughest races on earth and picked the Badwater 135 as the world's toughest foot race. So they said it, and then the athletes who've been coming to our race for 20 years all say the same thing, and they have to have such a long resume to even enter our race. Right. They really can talk about it compared to the other events. And Chris, one other thing, uh, if you had to list the toughest race or, or the toughest event, now I'm talking climbing Everest, uh, Ram, uh, Bad Water 135, uh, you know, um, maybe uh, crossing the Sahara, you know, any of these races, uh, Marathon de Sop, what would you say is the toughest of them all? Uh, uh, and uh, let's include into that the uh, Iditarod. Uh, you know, it's so hard to compare all of these things because they're so just dramatically different and take such different skills and mindsets and training and athleticism. Certainly in ultra running, it's the Badwater 135. We've now had three Badwater 135 veterans climb Mount Everest, uh, which is pretty cool. But I think uh, the number of people who've climbed Mount Everest is something like five times more than have run the Badwater 135. Uh, the Iditarod, one of my favorite sporting events, is just amazing. You know, 10, 14 days up there in sub-zero, sub-freezing, you know, weather, mushing dogs across Alaska. I love that. Uh, but ultimately, it's apples and oranges. And to be honest, even in ultra running, to compare our race is so difficult in certain ways that are also very unique to it. So it's not really a fair comparison. But ultimately, bad water is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> Look, like, I, I would agree. I, you know, People ask, you know, I, I, I've only competed in ultras on a bicycle, both mountain bike and road bike. Uh, nowhere near what you did. Uh, you did the Ram Race more than once, right? And yeah. you also did the Pack Tour, right? No, no, I never did. You that. never did Pack Tour. No, that's just not a real race. Right. It's just it's two hundred miles a day until you get there. Yeah. No. Much. When I did the Race Across America, it was about three hundred miles a day for just under eleven days from San Francisco to DC. Or as some people call it, the world's greatest sleep deprivation contest. But I actually slept more. Most of the people doing the race sleep 60 or 90 minutes a night, and I actually slept three hours a night. How did you finish, Chris, in that race? I was ninth. 
out of like 35 and I was the youngest finisher ever it was a distinction I had for 18 years. Yeah, some kid, a 16-year-old came along, right? No, no, no wait, 18. An 18-year-old. Yeah, 18 years after I did it, an 18-year-old from Alaska uh, did the race. And I went down to San Diego, which is where it started that year, and I rode out the first 35 miles with him. Oh, cool. And then I got on the phone with him right when he crossed the line, too, to congratulate him because he, he, he was two years younger than, than I was when he finished. However, wow. I was still faster. <laughs> There's a distinction for you. So, yeah, you know, these races, when people start talking about which one is the toughest, it's like, well, look, if you have a bad year of weather in, in Ram, that could be the toughest. If you have monsoons coming in early on Mount Everest, yeah, that could be the toughest. And yeah. God only knows what can happen out in the tundra. Uh, when you're doing uh, <laughs> the, the uh, dinner rod. So any and all of these can be the toughest at some point, right? Yeah. So um, Chris is pulling me back. Yeah, because my, my phone has to be straight up and down, right, unfortunately. So, am I okay my... right here? All right, there, see? Okay. You got to get in. Yeah, we got to snuggle. We have to spoon each other, Vinny. <laughs> this, this is wrong in so many ways. You'll see it on yours because yours is lagging behind because of that. See, we see mine in real time, and we don't see yours in real time. Um, but, but mine's more important. Yes, it is. But yours has a bigger viewership. Maybe. We'll see. Oh, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're going to have to have a nut rubbing contest in that, too. <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right, so, Chris, so, um, you have 27 people. I have 33. Oh, it's so, even bad. Well, let's get our, there we let's go. Let's get our rulers out right now. Uh, 32. Okay. Someone just dropped off. Oh, that's because we're. Talking about endurance sports instead of oh yeah, not people, people carbs. hate when I do this on my Friday. Show. But we're going to talk about all kinds of things. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, so let's turn. I'm turning it over to you. You can now interview me. Okay. I'm going to just take it easy today and just answer. All questions. right. So, so sit back so we can see you on my screen. And apologies to everyone that my phone tripod has to hold it vertical. And anyway, so uh, great to be here. One week from right now, we will be 14 minutes into the pre-race meeting for the 2018 Badwater 135, wow. the world's toughest foot race. And people will be able to watch it online at badwater.com. And uh, not the meeting, but the race. And so that's a week from right now we'll be having that. And so just a few hours prior to that, we have check-in for the racers. So I was just out in Death Valley and on the whole race route, actually, uh, Friday and Saturday. And so I wanted to give a few, couple of recaps before we or, you know, new things people should know before we start talking together. Uh, so Furnace Creek, there's been a bunch of the, the ranch, which is now called the Oasis at Death Valley, um, is being totally renovated. And the general store, the cafe, the bar, uh, the steakhouse and buffet, all of that is closed. And so I want people to know that when they get out there, uh, there's only one place to eat at the Furnace Creek Ranch, which is called the Date Grove Diner. Uh, also, with the general store closed, there's only one place to go shopping, which is the pro shop out by the golf course, which is also next to the Date Grove Diner. And uh, that's the only place that you can buy ice, water, uh, drinks, snacks, food, souvenirs, and all of that. So we, I posted videos of these uh, changes about at Furnace Creek to the Badwater page on uh, Facebook. It's facebook.com slash badwater135. So if you're heading out there uh, in the coming week for the race, you really need to sit down and watch the three uh, videos and, and the photos and things that I posted. Uh, also at the Furnace Creek Inn, which is up the road a mile up on the hill from the ranch is where racer check-in is. And that will be in a new location this year. It'll be in the Bighorn Room instead of in the Marquez Room. Uh, so that's new. And that's where racer check-in happens and retail, bad water stuff. And then the next day we have a Q&A session and a media meeting. All those things are now in the Bighorn Room. And then lastly, I wanted to mention that the timing checkpoint, the time station this year, instead of being right in front of the ranch, it's going to be by the gas station. And there will be dumpsters there, toilets, gas all night. And then uh, that's only about 100 meters from the pro shop, which is where the support crews can buy ice, water, snacks, etc., until 3 o'clock in the morning, the night that the race starts. So be sure you hit our Facebook page and uh, the event page for this year. So the 2018 Badwater 135 event page is where you will find that information, which is linked to from the Badwater page on Facebook. And I also emailed a lot of these details to all the racers and crew members, crew chiefs and staff. So check all that out. All right, so 
uh, you just want to show up in Death Valley with a lot of information and knowing where you're headed and what to expect. And especially if you're a veteran, because some of these things are new. All right, so uh, those are the quick updates. Uh, beyond that, now, uh, Vinny, you've been to the race several times. I have. You've been on a crew for Tony Portera, and uh, you've also crewed several times at Badwater Salton Sea uh, for Serena Scott Thomas's team that she's been out there with different people a couple different times. And uh, you've also been an endurance athlete your whole life. You're a veteran of my Furnace Creek 508 race a few times and uh, wrote the book Fitness Confidential. Yeah. And uh, which is mainly about me, actually, and the 508 bike race. It is. Yeah. It's, more of a, it's more of a story of Chris Kostman than it was of me or, or anyone else. Yes, exactly. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, we got a snuggle more here, so we're yeah, in the screen. We um, so, you know, first I wanted to talk to you about, you know, your involvement in endurance sports and, you know, People get good information, you know, if they if they look around carefully, because there's just a lot of knuckleheads out there dispensing advice and, and coaching and being, you know, self-appointed experts on things. So what are some of the dumb things and good things that you see happening when you've been out to these races, whether as an athlete or a crew member? Uh, I'm going to take one of the things I actually saw, uh, and this person may know who I'm talking about, but it was the dumbest thing I ever saw, uh, out in the desert to run without a shirt on. Yeah, um, yeah it's, that makes no sense because you're wicking water away from your body, yeah. you know, faster than anything, no matter, you know, a few years ago, Chris, I, you know, back when, when Carnese went out there and people really started paying attention to it, people were wearing these, what looked like these white space suits. Yes, some right? precautions outfits, the loose fitting, covering your whole body outfits from head to toe. It was like the KKK was running out in the desert. It was, you know, that's but it's it very like. effective. Yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't see those much anymore, and I wondered about that. It's like, why don't you see that? Uh, look, if you go out to any of the deserts around the world, you will see people covered in yeah. cotton from head to toe because they realize that, number one, the protection from the sun is the most important thing. Absolutely. Uh, number two, uh, look, they've always said the reason so much tea, hot tea is, is, is consumed in a desert situation is because it helps you perspire more. So you can get that cotton wet to keep you cooler. Uh, and it makes no sense to me when people don't do that. That's a great point, And I appreciate you bringing it up because nobody ever actually has before. And uh, there are more than one. Uh, runners who do the race with no shirt for for all or most of the race and it blows my mind every year because like like you said first of all they're just inviting skin cancer and you know looking uh, you know much older than they are uh, right too early in life but in the immediate sense they are not controlling their body temperature as well and they are dehydrating themselves when you go out to a place like Death Valley it's so hot and usually such low humidity that with every exhalation you're dehydrating and then you would just magnify that exponentially if you were to be out there running and sweating with no shirt on because you're just evaporating right off your, your body all the time. So that's a, that's a great one. I appreciate that. And I hope people pay attention and think about it because you're right. The first maybe 10 years that I was directing the race, people would be out there in loose fitting white clothing from head to toe and almost nothing was exposed except maybe their nose, people would even have white gloves on. Yeah. And yeah. that's a great idea because all of that is reflecting the heat and your sweat is going to be in it. The crew can spray them down and get that moist too. And then as the wind blows through the fabric, it cools you down. And so that that's uh, really important. And it's something that people have gotten away from. And, and I'm not really sure why, uh, but now you've brought it up. Well, you know, things, you know, you see things and they come into fashion and they go out of fashion. Um, I was up uh, hiking with my nephews in uh, Mammoth this last week. We were supposed to go to the portal and then climb Whitney, yeah. but we, we got caught in that, that St. George's firestorm yeah, that the came road was through. Closed. So yeah. we, we got X'd out this year. But one of my nephews showed up with uh, compression socks, and I started laughing, at it, and he goes, what's so funny? I said, well, when compression socks became a thing a few years ago, I said, this will never last. And everyone said I was completely wrong about that. Yeah. Uh, remember five years ago, you, you couldn't go to a triathlon or to any of your events without seeing these compression socks. Yeah. Now they don't exist. Yeah. You know, they, they've, except for my nephew, they've gone by the wayside. And my buddy said to me, he, go, he, he says, you know, my buddy was out there hiking with us. 
He goes, I remember you yelling about the compression socks, saying that they wouldn't last. How did you know? And I said, I know because the IOC. Uh, the International and, and, Olympic Committee. Yeah, and also uh, any, any of the, you know, WADA and all the governing bodies weren't outlawing them. Right. If they actually caused any kind of advantage, they would be outlawed. Right. Right. So if they're not outlawing them, they're not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, you know, typically Vinny esque unique way of looking at things. But yeah, I, I agree. It's, uh, it, it was a thing for quite a while. You still see a few people. I'm sure there's a few people out there shaking their heads at us right now. Um, but you know, there are also people out there who, uh, you know, scrape the salt off their saltine crackers to, to thinking that, Oh, if they eat that, they're covering all their electrolyte balances. So um, yeah, there's some some dumb old school things that stick around, and yeah. fortunately, most of them go away over time. What's it been like crewing out out there? I mean, it's hard on the crew, also. You know, the first time Serena crewed for me uh, is how Serena got interested in you know because she was a runner. She had just started running a couple of years earlier, and she said to me. She goes, you know, it was really, really tough crewing. You know, she crewed for 508 that the first year. Race, yeah, and she said, race. you know, I, I could never understand how you guys can just be on the bike. And I fell asleep. And she goes, I fell asleep in the van. And then I woke up and you guys were still riding bikes out there. And I fell asleep again. I woke up the next morning. You guys were still riding bikes. <laughs> and she goes, it was tough for me. Yeah. I can't imagine how tough it is you know, to, to actually be, you know, on the bike doing what you were doing. Yeah. And I said to her, trust me, you did the tougher part. <laughs> yeah. I've well, and especially in the tough. 508, because the support vehicle is basically following the racer the whole right. time. It's really boring because you're just yeah. stuck in this car driving along at the cyclist speed. But when you come out to the Badwater races, they're leapfrogging and they're getting in and out of the car and they're interacting with their athlete a lot more and the other crews and all of that. And so it's a lot more interesting than the bike race, but it's also a lot harder because you're exposing yourself to the heat and you have to drink and hydrate and worry about your electrolytes and your calories and everything as well, because you're working hard while you're out there taking care of your athlete. You're absolutely right. Uh, being a crew member is never easy. Look, I'm, I'm kidding about it being tougher than what the racer's doing. But as you know, crew dissension is one of the problems in all of ultra sports. Um, yeah. You know, th there's legendary stories from the aforementioned Ram, uh, and there's legendary stories from Badwater and everywhere else yeah. where the crew, you know, you're putting people together who may not know each other. Yeah. Uh, they may not even know the athlete in some cases. Yeah. Because they'll meet through. up through Facebook or a friend of a friend, and then they come out to support a runner they've never met, crewing with people they've never met. Absolutely. Uh, one of my life uh, – one of, he's now a lifelong friend. I spoke at his wife's funeral, uh, David Holt. Mm -hmm. uh, I met online. You know, I wanted to crew 508 the year before I did it. I wanted to take a look at it from uh, front row. And um, I was with a guy – a very religious guy and he found out that I was an atheist and he pretty much told me I was going to go to hell. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get to sit in the car for 40 hours listening to that. <laughs> well, luckily David Holt finished. Yeah. He's a fast guy. In, so in 30 can... something. Hours. Right. <laughs> but I'm riding with the guy going, Oh, you're going straight to hell. And I say, Oh, what else do we have in common? He goes, well, I like to make beer. And I go, I don't even drink beer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And beer is liquid bread. Come on. You yeah. did that even back then. Yeah, it, it was just not something I ever did. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, Ken Kochi is a great guy. He crewed for David a lot. And we're friends. I mean, you know. Yeah. But when you start off like that and you're the yeah. only two crew guys in the car, yeah. you start looking around going, oh, boy. What am I going to yeah, do this, now? Uh, I don't know what's going to happen here. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, the the – the dynamic between the crew and then the crew and the runner is a big issue. And, uh, you know, so many things can happen. So, for example, like what you're talking about, you can have crew members who aren't getting along well. Well, the most important thing if that happens is don't let the athlete know. Right. Because the athlete is focused on the race and running down the road and working their way towards Mount Whitney. And if they have to worry about their crew members getting along and that kind of stuff, that's just terrible because – uh, as you know, doing these types of events is like 25% uh, physical and 90% mental. 
Yeah. And if people, you know, lose their whole mindset because they're worrying about the crew, then that's not a good thing at all. Uh, so the first thing is try to get along, but if you don't, don't let the athlete know because the smallest type of negativity injected into their brain can really throw them off and, and bum them out. Uh, I, I want to add this. I've actually crewed for people. I enjoy crewing events as much as I love being in the event. Uh, I've crewed for people where, I, you know, they'll have a crew chief who's never done it before. And I'll come with my this clipboard that's sitting right here on my desk. I use it for everything. Mm -hmm. And I'll have a, a graph of everything, you know, how much food they're going to take in, how much you know water they're going to take in, how much electrolytes. And they'll look at me and go, what's that? And I'll go, oh, you need to write. Oh, yeah, we'll keep up with that. It's like, no, 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 no. Hours upon hours just happen. Yeah. And if you're not on top of what's going into your, your athlete, yep. you're going to be in trouble. He, your athlete's going to be in trouble really fast. And it, it always befuddles me that these athletes make it to that level without even considering this themselves. Yeah. And I wonder how they even make it through the event. This, this is a good point because the athletes, you know, 99% of the races that the Badwater 135 runners do do not have a support team. Or if they do, it's a support team that only meets them like every 10 or 20 miles or something at, at certain checkpoints. So to have a support team that's with you for the entire duration of the race and leapfrogging along, you know, a half mile, a mile, two miles, three miles each time provides just basically unlimited access to a zillion different things that you might eat or drink. Whereas if you're just doing it on your own or with a race, you're only going to eat, you know, a much more limited number of things. Um, Plus the race is so long. I mean, the winners are 24 hours and the limit is 48 hours. Yeah. So there she is, Serena. Hey guys. Come on in. Come say hi. Hey, I haven't seen you for very long. Mwah. Good to see you. Sorry, this sorry. is uh, anytime. Hi, hi. Serena Scott Thomas, multiple time Hello. Badwater Salt and Sea <laughs> finisher and many, many time Badwater 135 crew member. Pull up a chair if you can find one. Yeah, and crew member for and, 508. And, and crew member for Furnace Creek, by the way, good to see you. So we were, we were just talking about how important it is that the athlete going into the race have a plan for, I want to consume, let's say, 250 or 300 calories an hour, and I want to drink this alternating with that drink. With I want water alternating with an electrolyte drink. And then I want to take these different supplements and electrolyte pills hourly or every two hours. They need to have a whole plan, right. plan that out, explain it all to the support crew, have the support crew implement that plan and then track the plan because things always change. The athlete doesn't want this and prefers that instead, uh, or uh, maybe you can't do a leapfrog. You didn't, you can't pull over you wanted to. And so it was actually an hour and a half instead of an hour or something right. between, you know, taking care of the athlete. And if they're not tracking everything, uh, they're going to have a problem because you need to be following all of that so that the crew is monitoring, making sure, okay, the athlete is averaging. I, to me, I think what they need to track at the bare minimum is calories, water, uh, protein, uh, carbs, and fat, and electrolytes in general, and keep a running log of those so that you can go back at any time and say, okay, in the last three hours or six hours or 12 hours, uh, you know, she has averaged X number of calories per hour. This amount of it was carbs, protein, and fat, uh, this many electrolytes. And that way they know that they're, you know, doing what, you know, the general parameters that the athlete wants and right. needs. Uh, but also they can be analyzing it. If they see the runner is starting to, you know, fade a little bit or have some kind of symptoms or issues, they can look back at that and say, wow, you know, I see the electrolytes have really been low or she's only eaten carbs for the last six hours. And, you know, a lot of people think, that endurance sports is all about just eating carbohydrates, but that's not true uh, because you can only store so much muscle glycogen, which is energy stored in your body for a few hours. And then you have to be replacing that energy with what you're eating. But if you're going out for six, eight, 10, even 12 hours, you can get by on doing that pretty much just on carbohydrates. Right. But as soon as you get out there for more than 12 hours, you have to be eating fat and protein also. And a lot of people still don't know that. They've gotten away with doing longer races, uh, just grazing on like chips and pretzels and bananas and oranges and drinking Gatorade and stuff like that. But when you get into a race that's one or two days long or longer, you've got to have 
the fat and the protein in the diet uh, or the person they'll they'll run out of steam the muscles will break down their brain chemistry will be off they'll be sleepy all kinds of things happen so the so when you've crewed for for serena and other people out there in bad water what are some of the things that you see people eating that you think are a really good idea well you know back when i was a carb burner you know i, I do all this, i do all my stuff on fat now you know yeah. getting ready for a, an ultra distance kayaking event Mm -hmm. And I'm doing it fat adapted. There's no carbs going in at all. So you're not eating any carbs. No carbs. No, okay. I, For how I, long? I, uh, the events. Get, well, I was going to do a 24 hour straight, but I'm going to do two hours, two days of 12 hours each day. Okay. Because I don't want to be in the bayou at night on my first time. Yeah. I'm doing it on the bayou. It's over 100 miles long. Wow. Uh, it's going to be in heat. And uh, there are alligators, a lot of alligators. Like that, yeah. I'm not even worried about Snakes. the alligators. I'm more worried yeah. about the water moccasins uh, yeah, at sense, night. Yeah. So that that's what stopped me from going through the night because with those paddles, you can easily pull a snake up and into your boat. Wow. And during the daytime, you can see them at night. You can't see them. Yeah. Um, and they're out all the time. Um, but I'm doing that completely fat adapted. Hell, I, I, I was hiking for you know several days up the mammoth. Nothing but fat went into my body, fat and protein, you know, red meat. Yeah. Um, so it's very possible to do. Uh, to Tony Patera, the aforementioned Tony Patera, when I crewed for him, two things that I can note. <clears throat> One, that um, he never sat down the entire time. <laughs> so you crewed for a bit. Tony Portera, seven-time finisher at the yeah. Water 135, a couple times. Yeah, yeah. I, I coached him through becoming fat adapted and becoming ketogenic. Uh, and when I crewed for him, I handed him everything he ate. Okay. And I can say uh, that he the only thing he drank that had sugar in it the entire time was somewhere around the midway point, he drank some Gatorade. And that was it. Just, you know, a couple of swallows of Gatorade. That was the wow. only sugar he took in. So what kind of things was he eating? Uh, cold cuts, cheese. So slices of meat, cheese, yeah, uh, uh, olives, co coconut oil, olives, uh, you know, just anything oil. that was high fat, uh, avocado at some point. Uh, sometimes we would take the cold cuts, put cheese and avocado or olives in it, roll it up and hand it to him. Wow. And he would start, and most people walk a lot in that race. He would walk and eat it and continue on. Um, so, yeah, you could do these things completely fat adapted, but more to your point, when I was a sugar burner, mm. we had a saying, and a lot of people, I didn't come up with this, a lot of people have it, you're eating today for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So you, you can't just eat sugar all the time yeah. in these races because... It'll catch up. With yeah, you. it catches up with you so yeah. fast. And after the, uh, you can almost set your clock by it. At the 12-hour mark, if you're eating like a kid at a birthday party, mm -hmm. you know, just eating that icing from a, you know, like goo or whatever that stuff is, uh, you're going to start throwing up. Yeah, pretty, pretty quickly. You and you're just going to run out of steam. Yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't work. Yeah. This I learned this very early on in my career. Back uh, when I was 17, I set the first ever record for riding from San Francisco City Hall to L.A. City Hall. And uh, it was 472 miles. And I'd only ever raced up to 200 miles on a bicycle before. Mm -hmm. And you could get away with 200 miles, which I was doing in like 11, 12 hours on energy drink, bananas, granola bars, cookies, and stuff like that. Well, I, I'm i riding down from San Francisco, and I got to Paso Robles that evening about 12 hours in, and I was starving to death. Yeah. And so I had my support crew peel off, go to McDonald's, and they got me Big Mac fries and a shake. And that rejuvenated me like I couldn't believe and powered me for about six hours. And then I started to fade again because we didn't have any fat or protein in the car. We just had right. more, you know, electrolyte drink and fruit and granola bars. And so then I limped into Buellton, just north of Santa Barbara, and literally rode up the off-ramp from the freeway on my bicycle at like four in the morning, went into a Denny's, and I had a Grand Slam, which is, uh, you know, bacon, eggs, um, pancakes and, and then a milkshake and I just had all of this fat and protein basically and then I got back on my bike and I felt like a new person and so it's been ever since then that I've realized like you can't just do this stuff on carbs and now the other thing though that's tricky with people doing ultra marathons it's harder to eat when you're running versus bicycling because your body is bouncing up and down right. and you're feeling everything sloshing around more and getting you know bouncing around uh, and so that's a factor just and then the heat of something like the Badwater 135 yeah. makes a you know can do a real uh, number on somebody's digestive system. 
And so did, did Tony have any issues, you know, eating that kind of, you know, sort of solid, real food? Not at all. Um, you know, it was the first time he had, uh, I think he had done the jackpot that year, mm -hmm. the jackpot 100, uh, which is also a hot race is over in, in uh, uh, Vegas. He, he did that when he was completely fat adapted and ate the same sort of diet. Jackpot is a little different because you're doing loops yeah. and you're always coming back to the starting line. Um, so he had done it a couple of times and he knew it worked. Uh, Serena does a modified version of it when she did uh, Bad Water, uh, Salt and Sea. Mm -hmm. She eats a lot of, you know, fatty foods and proteins, but she still will, you know, when you get to that climb, once you get onto that dirt path. On the trail from Borrego yeah. Springs, yeah. Basically the, the, the bypass of the uh, glass elevator, as people call it. The road, yeah. Uh, you know, she, uh, she starts, she'll consume some sugar there on up to the top. Yeah. But she's mixing it. You know, she doesn't just subscribe to uh, having one thing. She'll go back and forth. Yeah. For most people, a mix is what's going to work. Yeah. And, of course, we're a week out from the race right now, so we're not telling everybody, like, don't eat carbs or something crazy like that if you're not used to that. If you're fat adapted, which means you're used to not consuming carbs, then, you know, certainly go for it and, and let us all know afterwards. Um, there's, you know, 100 or 99 runners in the race, and there's, there's probably 99 different ways of fueling. And, uh, you know, when people don't drop out, there are a variety of intermingling factors. Uh, but there's diet is almost always part of the reason somebody will drop out of the race because they're not eating or drinking well. Um, the other thing that's super important is having a wide variety of things to eat and drink. Right. Uh, so many people are, you know, used to these races, um, whether it's a loop race, like you just mentioned, or a race where there's aid stations every 10 miles or something, and they're just kind of eating what's provided by the organizers. They eat like five things or something. And it's okay. You can get away with that for, you know, up to a day or so, especially if you're just kind of doing what I call a hamster race, just doing sure. laps. But when you're out in a race as hard as the Badwater 135, you need a wide variety of things. And you've got that support vehicle. So put three or four coolers in that thing and bring out you know, all kinds of stuff. Bring your fats, your proteins, your carbs. Bring a whole selection of drinks, a whole selection of supplements. Uh, and things that you might only eat once, but, you know, if you've got it, you're, you know, you might use it. And if you don't have it, well, you're out of luck because there's only a handful of places, you know, from being there where you can buy anything. You can only Absolutely. buy things in Furnace Creek, Stovepipe Wells, Panamint Springs, and Lone Pine. That's four locations on the entire 135 mile route where you can buy things. And so, Bringing some real food, even if you're used to doing it on your sort of athletic food, you know, gels and bars and stuff like that, I guarantee you that at some point you're going to want and definitely need uh, some quote-unquote real food. And a lot of the crews, they end up, you know, the runners just, you know, dying to get to Panamint Springs or to Lone Pine because they just got to have a few slices of pizza or a burger or something like that and uh, just go for it because you're going to need it and if you don't put the fuel in the tank, the engine's not going to run. I see Tony Patera is actually on my Facebook feed. And he's uh, saying all true. Uh, he did do it at Jackpot uh, before the run. I can't believe I remember that because that was like three or four years ago. And I was, yeah. I was like, I know he does. And by the way, he, I think he won Jackpot that year. I believe year he did, one. yeah. Um, so it's not like this guy. People think, oh, these fat-adapted athletes are not as fast. Well, this guy did it on fat. Uh, you know, I had been coaching him for about a year and eating this way. And he called me up. He goes, yeah, I did jackpot. I went, oh, how did you do? I was hoping he finished. And he goes, oh, I won it. I went, age group? He goes, no, I won it. I was like, all right. Look, look awesome. at that. And, you know, th there's a lot of that that goes on. Um, hell, that, that guy, uh, I can't think of his name right now, uh, the guy that, that owned the, the site truly, uh, Sami uh, Inkinen, who who did the rowing race from San Francisco to – uh, Hawaii to the Big Island, wow. and uh, he did it on pure fat and uh, set wow. a record. You know, wow. He and his wife, a two two man rowing team. Uh, so there are a lot of people doing that. But as Chris said, as you know, never start anything on race day. That's why um, we sent out to everyone the Ultra Salt, uh, my product. We sent this to every one of the racers about a month ago, right? Chris? Yeah, maybe a month and a half yeah. ago. We sent a couple of bottles. And uh, don't fret if you guys got used to these things and you ran out and you didn't order any yet. 
Uh, there will be another bottle in the goodie bag. Their when goodie you check bag. check in for the race uh, yeah. a week from today, you'll get another bottle. Yeah. So, so tell me, you know, what were your observations about electrolyte replacement? There are obviously a lot of products on the market. Um, you know, what, what led you to developing this? What, what's wrong with some of the things that are out there? And what do people just not know? about electrolyte replacement. I mean, some people think, oh, if I drink Gatorade, I've got all right. my bases covered, which is not true. Right. Uh, so, so tell us a bit about that. The problem with Gatorade and all the Gatorade type products, even Pediasure and all this stuff, is it's all based on sugar. There's hardly any electrolyte. As a matter of fact, I think Pediasure has more electrolyte than anything else. Yeah. But that's still nothing. It's meant for babies, it's not meant for full-grown people, mm -hmm. even though it does have a little less sugar. None of the, all of it is just based on corn syrup, and it's not really good for you. Right. Um, so whether the minerals in it are good or not, they're de delivering it in a form that's sugar, food coloring, You would have to drink flavoring. gallons of it to even get near the electrolytes that you're losing. Yeah. Because it's mostly just fruit punch. Yeah. You know, it's the same stuff a kid gets at a birthday party. Yeah. Um, there were a couple of good products on the market. Uh, one of my favorites uh, was S caps mm -hmm. uh, and also um, uh, salt stick or two, you know, fairly good products on the market. But just like everything else we did at Pure Vitamin Club, or we have done so far at purevitaminclub.com, is how do you take something that's out there and improve upon it? And not just kind of improve on it. How do you make it, how do you hot rod it? Yeah. You know, how do you make it the real deal? Um, both of the products, the aforementioned products, um, that, that I thought were the best before mine came out, both have magne magnesium stearate. Uh, magnesium stearate blocks the absorption of other minerals. So that's not a good thing. Uh, you want to keep magnesium stearate on. You want to keep things like uh, titanium dioxide on, any of these excipients and flow agents. Uh, it, it, folks, it, it, isn't, I mean, if they're selling these products, they must be good, full of only good things, Vinny. Isn't that the case? <laughs> you would think. <laughs> you would think. You would think. And by the way, I, I had the guy from Salt Sticks on the show once. You yeah. know, he's got a pretty good product. But I tell people, if you want to see the truth, take two glasses of water, clear glasses. Uh, take their products. Take S caps or Salt Sticks. Open it up. Dump it in that glass of water. And you'll notice stuff floating at the top. It's not going to completely absorb. That's the magnesium stearate. That, that's, the, um, that's all the impurities. It'll just float. You can stir it all you want, and it'll just keep floating at the top. That's the stuff you don't want to have in your body. If you take pure vitamin club, ultra salt, drop it in water, it will all just dissolve. It'll, you'll see it just dissolve into the water. You're, oh, my God. You know, obviously, this is different. Your body's going to absorb this stuff. Um, I do it all the time. Now, if you have an eight ounce glass of water and you put five of them in there, you'll see some of the salt at the bottom because. But you and, wouldn't want to take that many anyway. Right. But what I'm saying is we all learned in, you know, chemistry class in eighth grade that salt in water will only absorb so much. And then once the water absorbs what it's going to absorb, the rest will just sit on the bottom. Yeah. That's if you know you have too much in that particular glass. Uh, and by the way, you don't have to do that if you're on a bike, if you're running. Just pop them, you know. We they're, they're capsules, you know. Yeah. I'll, I'll show you what they look like. Is and um, we did a lot of things with this product. It's um, we used uh, Redmond's Real Salt. Why is that important? Well, I started looking. You know, most of the product that's in a salt <laughs> face it to the camera, Chris. Most of what's in a, a salt capsule is salt. So, but what is salt? Sodium chloride. Uh, sodium chloride. Yeah. But not all sodium chloride is created equal. You know, like if you go get Morton's salt, you know, it's been bleached. It's been, you know, they, they've done a bunch of stuff to it. The eye guys, they, they've done all kinds of stuff to it. Um, but then, you know, we all learned along the way that, hey, there's pink sea salt and there's Himalayan pink sea salt. And there's all this other good salt out there that has more minerals in it, more trace minerals. So... To make this product, the first thing we did was I said, how do we get the best salt on the planet? How do we find that? So we just searched. And Andy Schreiber, the guy who runs the company, did this big worldwide search. Okay. Uh, and one of the best salts, as it turns out, is the, the, you know, this Himalayan pink salt. 
Uh, and there's some other fancy salts out there. So we, you know, we were getting ready to make deals with those guys. And one then of, what happened? Well, one of the problems with that is a lot of this stuff comes out of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And, you you know, you never know what you're getting. Yeah. You know, like they can say, oh, yeah, uh, the best, the best. Yeah, no, it's the same it's thing. The when best, you, when you see best. something is, you know, organic or whatever, and it's made in China. Right. You're like, okay, is it really? Right. Yeah. Is it really organic? And we have that same problem. Yeah. With this, you know, oh yes, uh, for you, best, best price, best price, the best. Well, the, best. the other know? thing is, if it's coming from Afghanistan, you don't know where that know where that money's going. It's and this true. could be like a side job for the opium poppy farmers or something. It, it really could be. You you don't know what you're doing there. And uh, so finally, we uh, Andy called me one day and he goes, "You're not going to believe this," but you know because we had been down the salt rabbit hole for about six months. Okay. He goes. If I told you the best salt in the world was right in the United States, would you believe me? I mean, I'd believe anything at this point. He goes, yeah, Redmond's uh, over. I said, oh, over in Utah. He goes, how do you know about this? I said, because I have a childhood friend who married a guy. My next door neighbor married a guy from Salina, Utah. Okay. Redmond and Salina, you don't know where one little town stops and the other one starts. I think if you added up the two towns, you might have 2,000 people. Okay. And the only salt people consume there is the Redmond's real salt. Made and it's extracted locally. 500 feet below the surface from an ancient sea that was there, you know, millions of years ago. Wow. The salt has not seen sunlight in 10 million years or something like that. And when you go to, when you're in Salina or Redmond, you go to any restaurant, you want to just eat the salt right out of the bottle. Right here, I actually have, I took this from 800 feet below. Can, can, can the audience see this? Is you it, show them there. Here, yeah. here we go. It'll show it over in the Yeah, room. that's actually, there it is. That's, um, that's actually Redmond's real salt taken from 700 feet below the surface. I was down in the mines. I don't just, you know, as you know, I don't just mail it in with these products. We actually go out there. See it in person. And do it. And make and deals. And, and it's a family-owned operation. It's actually kosher salt. You know, the, the, the Jewish rabbis go and bless the minds and all this. is all kosher. And, hmm. uh, but it's not just salt. It's not just salt. It's, there's 63 different beneficial trace minerals. If we put nothing else in this product and just put the salt, you're doing way better than what all the other companies are doing. But then we fortified it with um, potassium, magnesium, so, calcium. You know, so you're Well, getting... let's talk about that because a lot of people think, oh, we just need salt. Right. And they take literally salt pills or Morton salt and chug it and right. uh, or rock salt, and things like that. And you know, they'll, they'll get the they'll, they'll get the squirts. Yeah, you'll have serious digestive issues to right. put it nicely. If you just... Uh, eat pure salt. Also, you're almost certainly going to be consuming way too much, and so you're going to be bloating and having all kinds of issues. And so, um, th it amazes me that 2018, I still see races serving pure salt at the aid stations. I still yeah. see athletes taking it, advocating it. It's so like 1960s right. and older. Like what? What's up with that? And so. You guys have a, a much longer profile of ingredients like the hammer, nutrition, electrolytes. You know, they have quite a few things in it, but you guys have taken it to a whole extra level. And so why is that and how did you figure all of this out? Well, you know, we looked around and we, we tried to use, you know, whenever you derive, you know, magnesium or potassium or calcium from anything, you can, you can do carbonate, you can do citrate. Uh, you know, there's different forms that you can do. Uh, citrate, if you take too much of that in any of the, you know, the magnesium or, or potassium or anything, eventually you're taking it hour after hour. You can get the squirts. You can get stomach upset. You can get yeah. all this stuff. Diarrhea. Diarrhea. Just bluntly. Yeah. Uh, and we, you know, we went the extra mile. You know, we use the one that won't upset your stomach. That will actually help calm your stomach and not cause an acidic situation in your stomach. And, um. It, you know, it's just an amazing product. We, I, I can't recommend it enough. I know it sounds like a big old commercial. Yeah. But I'm a, you know, it's an ultra product, an ultra salt made by an ultra athlete yeah. who has spent a lot of years off the bike, having diarrhea out in the middle of the desert, throwing up over my handlebars just to keep going. So I know what it's like. Yeah. 
to have those issues. And so the first thing I said was, can I create a product where that won't happen? Yeah. You know, and that's what we did here. So of the, it hasn't been out very long, but I mean, have you gotten some reports like how much are people taking? Because that's one of the things I've noticed that varies very widely in the bad water 135. And of course, everybody's metabolism, metabolism is different. Everybody's size and shape is different. You've got 90 pound people and 190 pound people. Uh, some people sweat more than others. Uh, and then some people are eating a variety of foods that have got a lot of these electrolytes right. in them. And so I've seen, you know, I know people who alternate water with one noon tablet in water back and forth. And that is the limit of what they do for their electrolytes. And it works for them. But then I also know other people over the years who would be taking the Hammer Nutrition Endurolytes. And some people take one every three hours. And I knew people who were taking six of them every hour. Yeah, I'm one every. of those six every hour people. But okay. I'm a heavy sweater. Uh, I'll go out, you know, we've been having 115, we even had 118 degree weather here mm -hmm. last week. Yeah. Um, I'm a guy that will go out at noontime right up, uh, we have the Amundsen Ranch right near us, and, you know, it's up and down. Over a, a six or eight or nine mile stretch, I can probably get over 1,000, 1,200 feet of climbing in, in the heat of the day. I'm a heavy sweater. I grew up playing football in southern Louisiana. Uh, where I never passed out. You know, there were kids passing out on IVs and what have you. As long as I have water and salt, I can keep going. And I can tell you with certainty that every hour, uh, back when I used to take hammer nutrition electrolytes, uh, I would take six of those an hour yeah. in your race. Now, the first two or three hours, I wouldn't. Right. But once we dropped down into the Mojave Desert and the day started to heat up, it went from three an hour to five an hour. And then by midday, you know, by the time you hit Town Pass, yeah. you know, you, I was up to six a day. And even after you cross Town Pass, I would usually cross that still in the daylight. You know, I'm dropping down to still pipe wells. It would still be, you know, blistery hot there. Yeah, well, and it's always super dry. And so how much are people are taking of these? Do these? Uh, some people are taking one or two an hour, Some, you know, in race conditions. Some people are taking as many six or seven an hour. Wow. And uh, the reports we've been getting back, you know, I've been using them for about a year because I test on me. We test on other people. We tested on Serena and other athletes. Um, and we, we were trying to get people to screw themselves up with it on yeah. the test team. Take too many and yeah, see take what happens. Too many, and, and look, if yeah. you take too much, too much salt, you will, you know, cause some bloating. You will get stomach upset. And so, but you really have to take a lot of it uh, when you're exercising, especially if you're sweating. And when people ask me on Twitter, they'll go, well, how much? How much? Just tell me how much. And I'll go, I can't. Everybody's, I, I, everybody's you different. Know, if you're a heavy sweater, you're going to take more. If you're not a heavy sweater, you're going to take less. If it's wintertime and you're out cross-country skiing, you know, one an hour or one every other hour might be more than enough. Yeah. You know, for me, I, you know, I still sweat when I cross-country ski. You know, so I'll take two an hour. Uh, but that's not the six I would take when I go up on the Amazon Ranch. Yeah. Now, what do you think about people who go out and just do these? And there's no right or wrong. See, this is the thing that drives me nuts about so many yeah. coaches and nutritionists and <laughs> experts and all this is they'll say, you've got to do it this way. Right. And their way they say to do it just coincidentally is the way they do it. Right. And often the way they do it doesn't even work right. But because it's what they do, they think everyone should do it. So, I mean, there are athletes who do races like the Bad Water 135 and don't take any electrolyte supplements. Do you think they're, if, do you think if they're eating a wide ranging diet with a variety of salty things and different fruits and stuff that that's okay? Or do you think that, that is, you know, for some people you could do that. The, the one thing, you know, going back to, you know, Vinny looking at everything he did in his life, right? And I just third person the crap out of myself, but when I was in high school in Louisiana, you know, it's 100% humidity. It, it was actually hotter there than it is here with the 98 degrees in August and 100% humidity. And they used to give us these salt tabs. Remember the salt tabs? Yeah. It, was just a, it was just a salt. Yeah, it was like salt. having a teaspoon of salt in one fell swoop. And, yeah. you know, they would have it in a dispenser, you know, and they would tell us to take a handful of them and put oh. it down with water oh. on the way out, uh, you know, to the practice field. Okay. And I noticed very quickly on the days when I, I was never a guy to cramp up. Yeah. I just noticed my energy levels and the way I felt on the field on the days when I took it were much better than the days when I didn't yeah, take it. Yeah, you have to have it. I mean, you can yeah. definitely do too much, but if you go out without it, cramping 
all kinds of issues. But you see, I never cram, but I would, the energy level, and I was like, wow, really? Is this really happening? It got to the point where I would, I would bogart some of them and take them home with me so that I could make sure yeah. that the next day I could have them in me before I got to practice. Yeah. You know, it, you know that, that became a thing for me. And I was a salt guy early on because I saw the difference. Now, you ask yourself, let's say a runner is not taking them. Would the runner be better if they did take them? I can't answer that question. If, yeah. they're, getting, if they're sprinkling salt on everything they're eating that day, they're fine. Hell, I'll do a thing where, you know, I take these little vials of, of uh, Villa Capelli olive oil mm -hmm. with me everywhere. Uh, and I put one salt, one of my, you know, salt capsules in that little two-ounce vial. Mm -hmm. Serena does it too now. She, she calls it a caprese salad in a bottle, you know, because it's salty and it's olive oil. And, and you just pull that little thing out and drink it? I just drink it down. Yeah, I, so I'm olive oil with... Now with the contents of this poured into it. Right. Okay. And you, you have to shake it up. You know, you drink a little bit out and you shake it up because it all, the salt is heavy in it. Yeah, it doesn't mix in an oil as well. Right. It, you know, you shake it up and you just drink it down and you just continue on. And I've gone for indefinite, I'm doing that out in the ocean with the kayak, you know, because it's easy to get to. Yeah. Uh, the only time I'll lose the bottles is if I tip my kayak over, which I'm prone to do. You know, they see kayaks, but I always have a few up in the dry well up front yeah. that once I get the kayak right it again, I can grab a few more. You know, yeah. I carry 10 or 12 of these in a kayak and it, it works. You know, it, it really does work. Well, I'm definitely, I, I would love to know. Oh, here oh. we are. Here's yeah. one. This yeah. is what it looks like. And it's filled with olive oil. We keep them hanging around. So that's olive oil. Serena just brought them for Thank people you, listening Serena. to it on the yeah. podcast. You carry that and chug yeah. that. That's a couple tablespoons of olive oil, so that's some. Yeah, that's. I, I can't remember if that's the one ounce or the two ounce bottles, but yeah, you know, I sell them on my. You know, you can get them on my influencer page at Amazon. Um, and people go, "Why do you have those up there?" It's like we really use these around here, and they cut you know for like ten bucks, you get a dozen of them. Yeah. And the crazy thing is, is that you need the dozen because I stick them in Serena's purse. I have them sitting in the car. I have them everywhere because I can literally. That's like me run. with knives and flashlights. <laughs> you're, a knife, and you're a knife guy too, right? Yes, absolutely. I have knives everywhere. I don't go anywhere without a knife and a Fisher Space Pen um, and a flashlight. So. I, I still have my. I, why this, Chris? I'm going to impress the crap out of you. Yeah. Even and more. There's my Chris Costman. Yes. You have space the. Pen. You is have it, the. Is that brass or chrome? I'm. Okay. Oh, that's the brass one. Very nice. I have the cool Very one. nice. Yes. Yeah. Well, they're all cool. It's a Fisher Space Pen with raw brass edition. They write upside down. And, uh, and if you watch Seinfeld, you'll know all about that. Yes. Oh, whoa, whoa, that's a cool one. Blue with the bad water. Are logo. those, are you handing those out this year? No, they were a sponsor in, in the past. Yeah. I still have about a dozen, though. So yeah. if you're nice, we'll see. Um, <laughs> Wow. So I, I'll be interested to see, uh, you know, I, I kind of do some informal polling of the athletes at the finish line about what they eat and drink and stuff. So I definitely will I'll be curious to know if there's anybody out there chugging olive oil. Uh, so one question we got, uh, is there a risk in taking too much electrolytes during an ultra Stephanie peppercorn? Uh, good, good name for somebody asking about sodium. Uh, yeah. And so your people who were testing them and they took a whole pile of these things, did they have any particular issues or? No, it, it, you know, uh, my, one of my buddies got too much in him, you know, just like if you take too much salt, it will have a, you know, it will have a diuretic effect and, uh, yeah. you know, but you have to take a lot. Uh, so too right. much salt can make you, makes you diuretic. Uh, um, yeah, it, it can cause diarrhea. Yeah. That's, that's All of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I notice even if like, if I, you know, yeah, of course, three gallons of water will kill you if you drink it. Well, especially if you do it out in Death Valley and you wash all the electrolytes up. So that's, actually, I'm glad you just mentioned that because an issue that we've had with some athletes over the years and crew members is that they're only drinking plain water. Not good. Not good Not because good. You're, you're flushing all the electrolytes out of yeah. your bloodstream when you do that, and you can end up with hyponatremia. Yeah. And you can end up in the hospital or even die from that if you go far enough with A it. really so, bad medical condition. A guy killed himself in that race. What's that famous race in South America where they, it's like a 24 hour race to go over mountain and dale and everything else, rainforest. I can't think of the name of it right now. But he was he, just drinking pure water. He tried to, he wanted to hyper. Hyperhydrate? Hyperhydrate. That doesn't exist. Right. Right. And he, he just drank a ton of water and killed himself. Yeah. 
you know, at the start of the race, the guys were having trouble, and uh, they brought him in, and he died. They couldn't. People who go way out on a limb doing weird things, yeah. Like, once in a blue moon, they come up with some great no, idea. Idea, and other times they just totally screw up. I mean, we've had years ago one guy tried to do the whole Badwater One Thirty Five on just cucumber juice. That's crazy. That's all he. How was far did he make it? <laughs> Might have made it halfway, or I don't even think that far. Um, so. And other people do things that seem outlandish, like, uh, you know, two years ago, we had a guy run the whole thing in Luna sandals. Did and he make it? He made it. He did great. And he even took his sandals off it for like a 5K in the middle of the night and ran totally barefoot on the pavement. Wow. Uh, and so, you know, for him, he's used to running that way, super minimalist. He did it. And he was great. Other people go out and try just, you know, really unusual outlandish things, and they, they usually will crash and burn. So we just want people to take care of themselves, be smart, don't try to be a hero, don't try something really outlandish and new on race day, and uh, you know, be smart and you're much more likely to finish. And because we have such a you know, high qualifying standards even to apply, and then we have this really lengthy application that people have to submit and then we basically select the 100 competitors, we have really good athletes doing the race and they try not to blow it. Uh, because it was difficult to get into. They spent a lot of time and money uh, and energy getting there. And so we usually average around an 80, 85% finishing rate. Um, and that's why. But the, it's interesting when people, we always ask people when they drop out, well, why did you drop out? But usually they just say a simple thing like, oh, I had stomach issues. Well, but there's 10 different reasons that one might have stomach right. issues in a race like this. These things we're talking about are other things. Um, you know, we've had people, oh, the water is no good. Well, it's, you know, everybody else is drinking the same water. It's right. not the water. And, uh, uh, you know, people go out too hard. That's another really common one, especially with the race starting back in the evening again, like it used to do in the early 90s. Uh, you know, people head down the course, the sun goes down, and they think, oh, I can just run like hell. And they try to bank as many miles as possible. And they'll usually go to pieces uh, because, you know, they just burn themselves out. Because even though it's nighttime, it's still 100 plus degrees, it's still low humidity, they're still running on hard pavement, and they're going too hard and not keeping in mind that this is not 100 miles, it's 135. And so we see that a lot too. I mean, it must have been the same thing for you in the 508 and the bike race. Like a lot of times you move up in the rankings without even passing somebody. Right. Because the people ahead are dropping out, which... My first, the predecessor to the 508 was a 714 mile race that I did when I was 18. And I was back in like 50th place. And then I would pass some people, but I just kept moving up in the rankings. And I ultimately ended up in 12th, but only passed like maybe 10 of the 40 people that I passed because people drop out. And I don't understand why are these people dropping out when there's still time on the clock to finish and I'm en route to finishing and I'm going to make the time cut off. Why are they dropping out? And that's right. something I don't understand. And I'm guessing you relate to like you enter these things to finish first. Finishing is what it's all about. And that's why in the Badwater 135 and all of our races, we give the finishers the same award. Whether you're first, middle, or last, you're going to get the same coveted Badwater 135 belt buckle and the Badwater 135 official finisher share. Absolutely. And that's what people should be there for. So, yeah. And hey, look, I've been, and people have dropped. I've dropped out of a few races. You have. Too. I have too. I've dropped out of the five hundred eight. Uh, I had a knee problem uh, that just. It was that year when it was really windy, and uh, my, you know, I was hammering away. I was in third place overall. And when you're in third place, you want to hang on to third place. I'm not sure if you know there was so much wind that year. I'm not sure you and I. There was a piece of video of you and me walking together. I was walking. Yeah, I think it was bike. 2006. I want to say or something mm -hmm. like that. No, I dropped I out twice. I dropped out in the year before I finished, and in the year after I finished, yeah. I hurt again. And it was both. Well, the we call those problem. the thermonuclear headwinds. And going through yeah. Death Valley, people were giving everything they could on a flat road to pedal their bike at like eight miles an hour. If you, you know, if you were going eight, you were hauling ass. Yeah. It yeah. was insane, and a lot of people, and occasionally things like that are going to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, I take a little more issue with the people who are just like, oh, my gosh, I threw up once. I have to quit. Oh, God, if that happened, I would never finish. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, people who've seen the documentaries and films about the Badwater 135 have seen that puking is common. Yeah. And uh, it's not a big deal. And, yes, you're dehydrating yourself, and you need to replace those calories and electrolytes, you know, sooner than later. But just keep going. It's just 
it's just puking. Like it's no big deal. Um, yeah. And people drop out for all kinds of reasons, but fortunately the majority of them will make it, they'll get there. And I love being at the finish line to hand out those buckles and pose for those photos. Uh, it's a, it's an awesome, it's an awesome feeling. I want to say one more thing about dehydrating. <clears throat> um, a lot of races don't know this about themselves, but when you get into the months right before the race and you're putting in the big miles and a lot of times uh, the junk miles and this sort of thing. And, yeah. And you, you know, you think you're hydrating after, you know, after every run, after every cycling uh, day, you think you, but if you had your blood tested at any given time during that period, your blood will show some dehydration. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I would caution people, if you're coming up to a big race like that, if you like to have the glass of wine or a couple of scotches here on the weekends, once a week, you should cut all of that out. Yeah. Um, because you don't need anything else dehydrating you any further than you're already dehydrated. Uh, and think about that folks before, if anyone who's going to do the 135 coming up next weekend, start taking extra salt now in your food, sprinkle extra salt on, take extra electrolyte salts, you know, pure uh, ultra salts, take all of this stuff, and drink a lot of extra water, get a lot of rest, because the more you can get your blood up to to, to snuff before the race, the better off you are. Yeah. And because people I, are chronically dehydrated, just, just in normal yeah, life. Yeah. Just, just just because. You're right. And yeah. you know these folks, uh, you know, we look at them. They all look like they're in great shape. You know, you look at an Andrea uh, Coyman, who you had mentioned before we started. So she's she's on my mind. Or. Uh, uh, the woman who's my age, who's built better than me, and she she which finished. one? Oh God! Right, right. <laughs> the woman with a great tattoo on her body. I love her tattoo. Cheryl Cheryl Zorkowski. Yes, I yes. can never say her last name. Yes. You know, all of these people. You look at me. Oh my God, they're incredible athletes. But they, I'm telling you, they're always just a little dehydrated. Yeah. You always have to try to keep up, uh, especially the week before the race. And listen, folks, I get it. I'm going to be out in the desert next weekend. Uh, I love catching up with people I haven't seen in a year or two. And everybody's like roaming around talking. Get off your feet. Yeah. Get in the room with the air conditioning. <laughs> Don't walk yeah, around but... because you're wicking water away from your skin. Every time Every time you walk outside, it's just yeah. wicking every it away exhalation. from your skin. Every exhalation. Yeah, you go outside you, yeah. into the, the sun and the wind and all of that, you're just drying yourself out more. And so this this week is not only about tapering. Hopefully all the smart people are tapering with their mileage, but like you said, they're also eating better, drinking more, eating more, consuming more electrolytes, because even a small amount of dehydration, it will thicken your blood, I call it blood sludging. Yeah. It'll thicken your blood and then your oxygen doesn't move to the muscles as efficiently, it affects your digestive system, all kinds of things happen. And it's amazing how little people actually drink. Or a lot of people think, oh, when I'm running, I carry a bottle and I'm drinking and drinking. But then when they get back home, they don't keep drinking also. Right. Right. It, you know, just because you filled up and you feel like you're waterlogged, you're not there yet. It takes days to get your, you know, look, you could come back from a bonk, you know, a, a, a sugar deficit just by eating a Snickers bar. <clears throat> but you cannot come back from total dehydration. You will end up in the hospital. Yeah. Don't let that be you. No, absolutely. Because I want to see you at that finish line. Yeah. And uh, hand you that buckle and pose for that photo and give you that coveted T-shirt and then see you down there at the party in Lone Pine. Then you'll be there yeah. supporting people with with Andy. And, uh, you know, we've got almost 50 race staff. Uh, there's 99 racers. There's about uh, 300 350 crew members. There's the Park Service watching, the uh, the county, the Forest Service, the Highway Patrol. There's a whole lot of people watching this race happen and supporting this race and encouraging these runners. But people can really screw it up with just the simplest of things yeah. um, by not paying attention or by their crew not paying attention for them. Uh, and so, you know, we just want, you know, our goal in selecting the field is we're looking for people who can safely and successfully finish the race. And then, you know, how well somebody finishes or whether they finish at all is totally up to them and their support crew. And we just want people to get out there and have an amazing bad water experience and get that buckle and be on the website and in our Instagram and all that and and, yeah. uh, and give me a hug. So uh, Chris loves a good hug. <laughs> so I just love being there for these athletes and the crews and connecting with them and seeing it happen. 
And uh, it's really amazing. Like there will be people that I don't even really connect with until they're posing at the finish line, either an athlete or their crew member, and we just will look at each other and like totally get it. And yeah. uh, it's awesome. That's why I'm at the finish line for every finisher. I, I get up to Whitney Portal 21, 22 hours into the race with my team, and we set up the finish line, and I'm there for 48 hours until everybody crosses the line. And then I'm straight down the hill to host our party in Lone Pine at the school. And, uh, you know, it's a fantastic experience. It's my 19th year now doing this. Uh, hey, Chris, let me ask race. this question. You stay up the entire time, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I used to wonder about that with uh, the 508. It's like, God, he just passed me and took a photo of me. Wait, now he's at the finish line. When did he get the cat nap in? Yeah, and then I, yeah, I, 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 I learned this years ago. We were, we were having dinner one night. And I said, do you stay up? And he goes, oh, yeah, I stay up the entire time. But I wanted the audience to know that this guy is into what he's doing. Yeah. And uh, he does not go to sleep until it's all over with, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, well, I love it, and I and I care about everybody intensely, and I want to have a smooth event because our goal every year hosting the race is to be able to host it again next year. Right. And if our event goes well this year, then we hopefully get to come back next year because we get permits from the National Park Service, from Inyo County, from the Forest Service, from the Department of Transportation, and we're being overseen by the California Highway Patrol. And so we have to keep all those people happy and by having a safe and smooth event. And so I'm there not only, uh, you know, to help make sure that we have a smooth and successful event, but also because I just really deeply appreciate what people are doing, that they're spending their hard earned time, money and energy to be in this race or supporting this race. And, uh, and I love it. And I love being there at the finish line for all of them. And I'll sleep later. Uh, as the saying goes, you can rest when you're dead. Rest so. when you're dead. Uh, now Chris, uh, I apologize to your audience, but I need to do an ad for it because we are recording this. Yes. Folks, we were talking about them a little while ago, and I will talk about them again. It's in this bottle. I will show it to everyone. This is, uh, this is uh, the product that I've been talking about since the podcast started. It's yeah, the Capelli. best olive oil on the planet, Villa Capelli. No, they do not come in this bottle. You have to buy this bottle separately. Yeah. Uh, Villa Capelli, uh, I tell people, don't mess around. Get the three liter ten. Although they have uh, the organic one. oil and the whole thing, Chris Chris uses it. He's a big old vegan. Uh, they need to get fat <laughs> not anymore. Somewhere. Oh, thank God! No, no, I, I was only ever vegan. That's for a month. why you're looking better. Yes, and then I've been vegetarian for 29 years, and then I became a bacon eat, eating vegetarian. And now the past like eight months, I've actually been eating a little bit of couple ounces of meat i was going to ask it's like it looks like the gut has gone down yeah i've had i've had doing? some good influences in my life uh lately all right and uh and you've been played a big role in that you and serena what's just bringing my attention to uh the importance of you know eating a certain way yeah i figure you know just if we just brainwashed you enough that you would cross <laughs> over well that was how i became side. vegetarian in the first no okay. <laughs> but yeah i mean you know, we live and learn with life. If we keep doing the same thing forever, then we're stuck in the mud and there's always new information coming out. And we should, you know, I yeah. read the news voraciously. I pay attention to people like you who I respect tremendously that know a lot, whatever the field is that I'm interested in. I pay attention to the experts and, uh, you know, eating important isn't eating well, isn't just important during a race. It's important all the time. Yeah. yeah so and, yeah. And, and, and the olive looking... oil rules, I, I get the, the three liter tins of it also. So, yeah, good stuff. No, Villa Capelli is, look, I, I was talking about them before they paid me a dime. Love this stuff. Um, you can go to vinnytoteries.com, click through the Villa Capelli banner. When you get to checkout, no matter what you buy, when you get to checkout, put in the promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E. Do not put the wimpy Y on there. You know, they just yeah. won't recognize that. You got to put the I-E on there. You get 10% off your entire order. They have all kinds of spices and just a bunch of great stuff over there. We love it all over here. You will love it wherever you are. Villa Capelli Olive Oil. Uh, Chris, we have anything else? No, just uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. The race is July 23 to 25, with the racers starting at 8 p.m., 9.30 p.m., and 11 p.m. California time. Uh, there is a webcast at badwater.com. There's GPS trackers on every athlete, so you can see where everyone is in real time. There are time splits along the course, which collate into elapsed time so that you can see how the different waves compare against one another. We're pushing out a lot of images through Instagram. It's uh, at badwaterhq. 
uh, as well as our Flickr accounts that are linked from our webcast at the badwater.com site. So tune into that and follow the race. And uh, we've got 22 countries represented and 22 American wow. states by just 99 athletes. So it's, I like to call it the de facto uh, Olympics of ultra running. And it'll be awesome to have you and Andy out there supporting the race too. And Serena will be out there. And Serena's coming. Yeah, Serena's Serena's going to be together. Yeah. Or do I get yeah. to steal Serena to work with me? Uh, she will be with us, but you can steal her away uh, and keep her out there if you want. Um, I think she's got real estate and some acting stuff to do here. But hey, if you could get her to stay <laughs> yeah, there, yes. she'll stay. Well, and uh, the smart athletes will be taking their ultra cell electrolyte complexes from Pure Vibin Club. And uh, there's Serena. And yeah. uh, we're wrapping it up. All right, so let me say goodbye. And Everybody, let me thanks for tuning in. I'm going to turn mine off while you wrap yours down. Yeah, uh, folks, uh, if you like what's going on here, um, you know what to do. Before you go to Amazon, go to VinnyTartarus.com, click through the banner. It puts coal on the fire, gets our train down the track. Incidentally, when you click on that banner, you will go directly to uh, my influencer page. But trust me, anything you buy there, you, you'll find these little vials there. You'll find everything else I talk about on my influencer page. But once you're there, uh, anything you buy will um, help the cause. So please, please, please do that. Uh, on behalf of Chris Kostman, my name is Vinny Tortorich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm. Good job, Vinny. Thank you. Everybody, thanks, thanks for tuning in. This has been awesome. Yeah, this was really cool. And I will say goodbye to my Facebook page. Get in here for a second, Chris. All right. Wave to everybody to do that. Look at this amazing high technology. <laughs> Turn yeah. off our spotlights. We're, we're doing that to do this, to do that. And uh, there's Serena. And uh, that's it. So I'm going to end mine right here. Cool.